When was Jesus born? Although most Christians celebrate December 25th as the birth date of Jesus, almost all of them are pretty sure that wasn't the real date. So in this video, we'll use the Bible, history, and astronomy all in combination to unlock this ancient mystery and maybe even the year of his birth and come up with some very surprising answers. Like not only when was Jesus born, but also where within Bethlehem itself was Jesus born. I am sure there are a number of new clues in this video that you have never seen before. So let's get started. The Bible gives us clues, probably more clues than you think, but simply doesn't tell us directly the day or year of his birth, or even the time of year. So if we're going to figure this out, we're going to need to use all the clues at our disposal in the Bible and in history and combine them with science. Let me give you an example. December 25th isn't likely. Because the Gospel of Luke tells us the shepherds had their flocks in the field overnight. Winter was the time of year when the shepherds would not be overnight in the fields or have their sheep overnight in freezing conditions. October was the latest they were in the fields. They would return in the early spring. Another common misconception is that Jesus was born on the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles because the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus tabernacled among us. But this is also highly unlikely for reason of these exact same shepherds. It was a requirement that adult males be in Jerusalem for the feast, not out in the fields. So why am I confident that our top 30 rated YouTube community will get close to the right answers? Because we are a community, that is our strength. I'll get us started with this video, and you be sure to join in the comment section. It may be your comment, combined with someone else's, that makes the difference. The first question you might ask is why look at this at all? Is it important? No, in the scheme of things, if it was important, the Bible would tell us. What is important is that Jesus was born, not when. But if you love someone, you'll want to know all about them. And I love Jesus, and I bet you do as well. When was Jesus really born is a popular question for that very reason. So let's start with why December 25th was chosen as Jesus' birthday in the first place. The Bishop Hippolytus of Rome in 204 AD was the first to select this date because it was nine months after the spring solstice, which he assumed was the date for the conception of Jesus. Where did he get this idea? Well, an ancient tradition in the early church was that Jesus was conceived and died on the exact same day of the year, which church father Tertullian, among others, assumed was March 25th. Now, there is no science or scripture behind either of these two ideas, but December 25th, has something else going for it. Mid-December marked the Roman holiday of Saturnalia, a mid-December reverie in honor of the god Saturn, who probably was Satan, which lasted a month and included, among other pagan festivities, a gift-giving and lighting of lights, common practices even today. Most historians have concluded that the church decided that the celebration of Jesus' birth would be held on December 25th, in part in order to clean up or sanitize this Roman festival, as many of these pagan holidays enticed new Christians to participate. It was hard for them to give up a holiday they'd enjoyed since childhood, and associating Jesus' birth with this holiday gave early churchgoers an excuse to keep up their celebration. A Syriac manuscript from the 1100s records that this festival was still being held in the Middle Ages. 
It was a custom of the pagans to celebrate on the same December 25th, the birthday of the sun, at which they kindled lights in token of festivity. In these solemnities they, and reveries, the Christians also took part. Pope Julius I formalized December 25th as Christmas in 350 AD. So does this date have pagan roots? <laughs> well, absolutely yes. Should Christians celebrate it? We'll discuss that important question toward the end of the video. In the meantime, let's begin to look at more biblical and scientific approaches to when Jesus was born. There are three parts to this answer. What year was he born? What season of the year? And if we can, even the exact day. One common theory is that Jesus was born in the spring, which was the lambing season when new lambs were born. That Jesus, as the Lamb of God, would be born at the same time as the other lambs. Seems to make sense. The other common theory is that he was born in the fall during Israel's high holy days. Let's keep both in mind as we investigate. Let's begin by considering what year Jesus may have been born. In order to do that, we are going to need all the scriptural clues we can find in the Bible. There is one main clue about the year. It was about 30 years prior to Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. There are three supporting clues. Herod had to be alive, it was during a census, and the star of Bethlehem was in the sky. However, as with all ancient dates, none of them are really assured. Ancient calendars might be off by a year or two, so please keep that in mind. Let's look at that main clue. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, Luke 3.23. So if we can figure out the timing of this baptism, we can subtract 30 years and should be in the ballpark. Luke also tells us when John the Baptist began his ministry. In fact, Luke is incredibly specific about this. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was the tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. In the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Luke 3, 1 through 2. Luke is a very careful historian and he gives a number of clues as to what year this was. But before we get into them, the real question is, how did he get all this information about this year? Luke was writing about 35 years after the fact. How did his sources know John started his ministry in this exact year? Well, because it was a very, very, very important year. And that fact has been ignored in the study of Jesus' birth. It was most likely the final year of the 69th Shabua, or week, of Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. The prophet Daniel was given a very detailed prophecy of when to expect the Messiah. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, Daniel 9.25. And I guess this was that year, the last year of the 69th week. And we can be pretty sure the ancient priests and Levites knew this was the year. We know that because of the question that they asked John. The Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. John 1, 
19 through 22. Those are the most unusual questions you would think to ask anyone out in the middle of a desert. To ask if he was the Messiah or Elijah who was to precede the Messiah? That is, unless this was the year they expected the Messiah to come. These questions by the priests indicate they had the Messiah on their mind. And the large list of who was emperor, governor, high priest, etc. in Luke's account indicates to me that this wasn't just any year, but one to be remembered even 35 years later. To confirm this, look what Luke also tells us about this year. The people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ. So not only did the priests have the Messiah on their minds, but all the people that year were wondering about the coming of the Messiah as well. So this is a huge clue. It most likely was the last year of the 69th Shabuah of Daniel. And if we are able to calculate when the first year was, well, we'll know that year. In my 2018 book, 70 times 7, we calculate all these dates. Sometime in the spring or summer of next year, God willing, we will do an entire video series on Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. But until then, if you want to know our reasoning for choosing that date, I refer you to the book. However, the ultra short version is the prophecy began in 457 BC, the Jubilee year that Ezra returned to Jerusalem. And 69 sets of seven years later was 8027. So that is our best guess for when John started his ministry. Let's see how that compares with other clues given to us by Luke. The main clue that we've already seen is that this was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, a relatively well-known date. Tiberius Caesar began his reign in AD 14, though certain factors in the transition of leadership during the last years of Caesar prompted most scholars to consider that Tiberius' reign might be counted from as early as AD 12. So we have like a two-year range. So the 15 years later would be somewhere between 27 and 29 AD, which is totally consistent with our biblically constructed date. Let's see how this compares with the other historical reigns. Herod and Philip reigned over a very long period of time and are not much help in narrowing it down. Caiaphas served as high priest from AD 18 to 36. And although the Romans removed his father-in-law Annas from office in AD 15, Annas continued to exert his authority in Judea through Caiaphas's high priesthood. So it was kind of a joint high priesthood, just as indicated in the gospel. Pontius Pilate's reign is a little more helpful. He served as governor of Judea from AD 26 to AD 36. So all these other figures are in line with the date, AD 27 to 29, that we just determined. So what age range was Jesus when he was baptized? Because that is, after all, what we're after. Scripture tells us Jesus was about 30. If he was exactly 30, that would place his birth year at 3 BC to 1 BC. Remember, we have a range and we don't count the year zero. There was no year zero. If Jesus was born before that, he would have to be older than 30 when he was baptized. And since 6 BC to 4 BC are the most common suggested dates, let's see if those common dates make sense. In order to do that, we have to ask why Jesus got baptized. It wasn't for the same reason that the rest of those in the Jordan did that day. They were all baptized for the remission of sins, as John told us. But Jesus, he was sinless, 
So why did he do it? Jesus was the Messiah, which means the anointed one. High priests and prophets were anointed, and so were kings. Jesus was prophet, priest, and king. So he was obviously anointed for each of these roles. When was it? And who did it? I contend it was his baptism. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit who descended like a dove. At what age did priests usually begin their ministry? From 30 years and upward, even to 50 years old, all who entered the service to do work in the tent of meeting. Numbers 4.3 So if priests began their ministry at 30, hmm, probably so did Jesus. Which would explain why he might be anointed and baptized earlier than his 30th birthday so that he could begin his ministry when eligible. It is more doubtful that he would have been older. Not impossible, but more doubtful. So when Luke says about 30, he most likely meant a couple of months younger than 30, allowing him to start his ministry on time. Now, I think we're getting somewhere. How much younger than 30 might Jesus have been at this point? We know from the Gospels that after his baptism, he would have been led into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. In my opinion, it was likely that much prior. Then in Luke 4, we see that after being tempted in the wilderness, Jesus returned to Galilee and began preaching in that region. On a certain Sabbath, he entered the synagogue in Nazareth and opened the Isaiah scroll and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me. Notice God had already anointed him at this point to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. After this, Jesus said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus said, Today, this is fulfilled. Not earlier, but on that very day. So in my opinion, this was the beginning of Jesus' ministry right then and there. And what day of the year was it? By quoting Isaiah, Jesus proclaimed it the favorable year of the Lord. So it was a new year. He was proclaiming it. Hebraic secular years begin on Yom Teruah, or what we now call Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets. And Jubilee years begin on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So we have it narrowed down to two possibilities. So what was the year of the Lord? Was it a Jubilee? Many say yes, because Isaiah indicates Jesus would be setting the captives free. Something that does happen on Jubilee. But this is not necessarily the only option. Every seventh year, or sabbatical year, or Shemitah year as it's termed, was a year of the Lord, just like the seventh day was the day of the Lord or the Sabbath day. And guess what? Each of those years of the Lord were also a year for releasing slaves. At the end of seven years, you shall let go every man his brother that is a Hebrew, that hath been sold unto thee, and hath served thee six years. Thou shalt let him go free from thee. Jeremiah 34, 13-14 So that aspect of the prophecy about setting the captives free, surprisingly, is a draw. Not only is the term year of the Lord properly associated with the Shemitah year, but remember the priests and Levites coming to John the Baptist because of the, it was the end of the 69th week of Daniel, and they were wondering if John was related to the Messiah. Well, the last year of the 69th week of Daniel was a Shemitah year, not a Jubilee. The Jubilee wouldn't happen for another seven years. So, we have a match. We have a perfect match. 
So we now know that Luke 4.18 was a new year, a Yom Torah new year, probably in A.D. 27 perfectly fulfilling Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks, that it would be seven Shabuah and 62 Shabuah, they're the sabbatical cycles of seven years, until the Messiah, in fact, fulfilling it to the day. Now, the million dollar question I ask myself at this point, was this also Jesus's 30th birthday? Did he start his ministry on his exact 30th birthday, the earliest date allowed by Hebrew law? We will answer that question later in the video, but if correct, that would make his birthday, Yom Torah, of 3 BC. But if you remember, the majority opinion is that Jesus was born between 6 BC and 4 BC. Why is that? Well, because Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, seemed to imply that Herod died in 4 BC, and it is mandatory that Herod still be alive when Jesus is born, because he met with the Magi, famously killed the innocent babies of Bethlehem, and both Matthew and Luke relate that Jesus was born during Herod's reign. This date of 4 BC is based on Josephus' remarks in Antiquities 17.6.4, that there was a lunar eclipse shortly before Herod died. This is traditionally thought to be the eclipse of March 13th, 4 BC. Therefore, it is often said that Jesus had to be born before this, in 4 BC or even 6 BC. But physics professor John A. Kramer thought differently. In a letter to the Journal of Biblical Archaeology, he has pointed out that there was another lunar eclipse visible in Judea, in fact, two of them, in 1 BC, which would place Herod's death and Jesus' birth more toward the turn of the era. Kramer also points out that the traditional eclipse in 4 BC was very, very minor, a partial eclipse and late at night, not one likely to be remembered or recorded, unlike the two more prominent eclipses in 1 BC. So right there, the date of 4 BC comes into question. However, there are other factors as well in regard to the date of Herod's death. Here is what else Josephus has to say. So Herod, having survived the slaughter of his son Antipater, five days died, having reigned 34 years since he had caused Antigonus to be slain and obtained his kingdom but 37 years since he, he had been made king by the Romans, and that's from War of the Jews. Josephus dates Herod's death by three events, five days after the execution of his son, 34 years after he conquered Jerusalem, and 37 years after he had been made king by the Romans. And it is based on these factors that the 4 BC date was also established. However, we don't have good data about the death of Herod's son Antipater. So the length of his reign is all we have to go on it. And it is a hotly contested issue, one that we could spend an entire video on. One thing to remember, however, is that Josephus was not a perfect historian. I know, shocking. The appointment of Herod as king by the Romans was over a hundred years from the date that Josephus wrote about it. Josephus said this appointment of Herod as king by the Romans took place in 40 BC, but Roman historians Appian and Dio Cassius, both of whom said the appointment of Herod took place in 39 BC, to which you might say, okay, yeah, 39 minus 37, it's still 2 BC, it's not 1 BC like you're saying. However, this is not how Josephus dated reigns. Consistently, in all of his histories, he did not count any king's partial first years of reigning. He would have skipped Herod's partial first year as well in 39 BC. He would have started his count with 38 BC. Count 37 more years forward, and you do have 1 BC. Now, I realize what we just went through with Herod's death 
was pretty heavy-duty historical-type reasoning. Maybe it kind of bored you a little bit, but think about what it means. The only real evidence that anyone has that Jesus was born as early as 4 to 6 BC is this death of Herod, and we have just cast significant doubt on that date. The Bible is the only infallible record we have. And as we've just seen, a 1 BC timing for the death of Herod better lines up with the material in Luke and Daniel's 70 weeks. My opinion is the Bible should trump any other minor issues. Remember, we're dealing with 2,000-year-old historical records in terms of Roman records and Jewish records, which are incomplete and inconclusive at best. This brings us to the third factor in the debate about the year Jesus was born. The census ordered by Caesar Augustus during the governorship of Quinarius, as recorded in Luke 2. This is probably the most famous census in all of history, known by Sunday school students the world over. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken in all the inhabited world. This was the first census taken while Quirinarius was governor in Syria. A well-known census occurred during the governorship of Quinarius in AD 6, but as we've seen, this is way too late to be associated with Jesus' birth. Could there have been an earlier one? It's almost a foregone conclusion that censuses in those days were delegated to each small regional governor to accomplish the way that he wanted. And this seems to be what Luke tells us too. This was the first census taken while Quinarius was governor in Syria, Luke 2.2. Quinarius was running the show. And if you notice, this was the first census. It implies that the recorded census of 86 may have been the second. This double census makes sense. A census was a huge undertaking. In those days, it is understandable that it might take up to 10 years to complete and maybe even more than one governor to complete the process. And in Israel, where ownership of land reverted to the original family with each jubilee, doesn't it make sense that a census and accounting of ownership would take place where the family land was? Of course, it makes perfect sense that Mary and Joseph would return to Bethlehem. Finally, critics say Josephus didn't mention this earlier census. Well, that's true, but a greater historian than Josephus did. That's Luke. Luke, who was likely older than Josephus, who wrote 70 years removed from the first census, or the starting of the census by Quinarius, probably almost no one alive in Josephus' circle remembered things that far back, and the intricacies of it, who was governor, etc., an important issue to remember is no one at that time knew we would be asking these questions in order to record all the details we needed to know Jesus' birth date. So the census doesn't help us date the year of Jesus' birth, but it doesn't harm our efforts either, which brings us to the mysterious Star of Bethlehem. Hundreds of possible stars have been proposed over the years, from comets to astronomical alignments of stars and conjunctions to a supernatural star from God. All of the astronomical signs depend on the proposed year of Jesus' birth. If you believe it was 6 BC, you'll find your star there. If you believe it was 3 BC, you'll find your star there, etc. We could do several videos based solely on the star of Bethlehem, and maybe someday we will. But we won't get into that level of detail in this one. However, I do want to mention one theory. Our working theory is that Jesus was born in 3 BC, based on his age when he began his ministry in AD 27. Did anything happen in that year, 3 BC? The answer is yes. The only potential Star of Bethlehem candidate with biblical backing. In Revelation 12, we read, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon at her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. 
and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. Much has been made of this great sign, and who the woman and the child are. But if the child is Jesus, and this is a spiritual depiction of his birth, as the majority of scholars believe, was this great sign the star of Bethlehem? Almost 30 years ago, Ernest Martin published a book, The Star That Astonished the World, proposing exactly that, that Revelation 12 was the star of Bethlehem. Martin claims the above passage gives the exact day and time of the virgin birth of Christ by first recognizing that these symbols might also be astronomical constellations and bodies. If the woman is symbolically referring to a constellation, that would have to be Virgo, the only constellation that is a woman, and that the sun being in a constellation or clothing a constellation is the very definition of a zodiac constellation. For Virgo, this occurs in September and October. It means the time of year when during the daylight hours, the sun is found in this constellation. Martin then looked into the position of the moon. He claimed that John's description in Revelation actually gives us the exact day and time within a 90-minute period of this event. Revelation 12.1 tells us that the moon was under her feet. The feet of Virgo represent the last seven degrees of the constellation. In order for the description in Revelation 12 to be astronomically satisfied and represent the birth of Christ, the moon then has to be positioned somewhere within these last seven degrees. At the same time, however, the sun must be positioned mid-body, so the constellation has the clothing appearance. In year 3 BC, these alignments occurred on September 11th, 3 BC, which was Yom Torora, beginning at 6.15 p.m., which was sunset, and it lasted until 7.45, when the moon set. This is the only day in the entire year that this alignment appeared exactly as described by John. And this day was Yom Torah, Rosh Hashanah, the new year, and one of the seven Moedims or feasts of the Lord. And this is easily reproducible with star mapping software available today. Dr. Joseph Lenard is a member of this ministry's advisory board of directors. And he has written a wonderful book, The Mysteries of Jesus' Life Revealed, that discusses the role of this day, Yom Torora, or the Feast of Trumpets, in regard to kingship and why this would be a very appropriate day for Jesus to be born. I quote Tishri 1, which is Yom Torora, was the day that many of the ancient kings and prophets of Judah regard as their inauguration day. This was certainly the case with Solomon, Jeremiah, and Ezra. Other important events occurred on this same day. On Rosh Hashanah, Joseph was freed from an Egyptian prison and subsequently became viceroy of all Egypt. Martin also notes that other prominent men, whom he claims were Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Samuel, all appear to have been born on this same day, Tishri 1, the Day of Trumpets. And dating back nine months or so, we can arrive at a possible conception date for Jesus. This would be during the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, and rededication in December. This alignment of Hebraic feasts for these crucial milestones in Jesus' life, his conception and birth, seems very appropriate. So, have we figured out Jesus' birth date? Was he born on Tishri 1, 3 BC, or in our Gregorian calendar, September 11th, 3 BC? We simply can't say with absolute assurance. However, Let's continue to look at clues in terms of the time of year, because that might even give us more confidence. And a big clue involves the shepherds watching their flocks in the fields that night. 
Bethlehem was a very special location in terms of sheep. Within Bethlehem was a location known as the Tower of the Flock, or the Migdal Edar. According to Edersheim's classic book from the 1800s, the Rabbinic Mishnah indicates the sacrificial sheep raised for temple sacrifices in Jerusalem were housed there, in Bethlehem. And of course, Jesus was the Lamb of God, so it is fitting that he was born there too. So was he born in the Tower of the Flock? Micah seems to indicate that he was, referring directly to this tower. And thou, O Tower of the Flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom, after all the Messiah shall bring the kingdom, shall come to the daughter of Zion. Micah 4, 8. So why were the shepherds not in the tower that night, but out in the field? Sheep were traditionally only kept in the tower during winter when it was cold and during the lambing season as a means of protection. So September was totally consistent with the sheep being out in the field and not in the tower. So it was available to Mary, Joseph, and Jesus for that special night. This also casts some doubt on Jesus' birth being in the spring or lambing season. As we spoke of at the beginning of the video, since the mother sheep and lambs wouldn't have been in the fields, they would have likely been in the tower for safety. So Jesus was likely not born in the season of lambing, but in the place of lambing, the tower of the flock. Now, the birth of John the Baptist is also consistent with Jesus being born in September. But like everything else in this discussion that we've given you today in this video, it's complex. The book of Luke tells us that John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. We learn that in Luke 1.26. The gospel also seems to indicate when John was conceived. So it's possible to approximate the time of John's birth and then by extension, that of Jesus. John's father, Zechariah, served as a priest in the division of Abijah. Jewish priests were divided into 24 courses. The order of Abijah was the eighth priestly course. We learn that in 1 Chronicles 24, which served in the temple during mid-May to mid-June, also mid-November to mid-December, and during the weeks of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So we have like five sections of time. Now, Luke 1, 23 through 24 tells us that Elizabeth, John's mother, became pregnant right after Zechariah's service in the temple. That means that John the Baptist would have been born nine months after one of those five service times. We can estimate that it would be March, August, or September. And by extension, Jesus then would be six months later in September, February, or March. That doesn't narrow it down a great deal, but it helps. September, our best guess, is still one of those times, so this is still consistent with our best guess. So, in terms of when and where Jesus was born, we really have a pretty good estimate, I believe. On the Feast of Trumpets, 3 BC, in Bethlehem, in the Tower of the Flock. This is consistent with the date and baptism of Jesus in AD 27. It's consistent with the start of Jesus' ministry on the Feast of Trumpets. It's consistent with the estimated death of Herod in 1 BC. And it's consistent with the great sign in heaven of Revelation 12. God's word has given us an abundance of clues as to the birth of his son, Jesus, but not a date. So we have given you our thoughts. Why not give us yours? There are absolutely no right answers. And now let's talk about that December 25th date. I think it's totally appropriate for Christians to celebrate the incarnation and nativity of our Lord. And it's also 
totally appropriate to share that very publicly with Christian symbols like nativity scenes, wishing people a Merry Christmas, and public testimony. But there is no denying that a lot of the Christmas symbols and the very date, December 25th, have pagan origins. If this offends you, don't celebrate. It's entirely up to you. It is not sinful either way. And if you want to see our companion video on the mysterious Magi, who traveled to see Jesus as an infant, click on the link when it appears. This is Nelson, and I'll see you there.